Welcome to the 88th Coalspring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology. Uh, the topic this year is Brain Body Physiology, and I'm Jan Vinkowski from Coalspring Harbour. I'm very pleased to have Richard Flavel with me from uh, Yale, another Brit. Absolutely. Yeah. So I am going to show, I'm going to confess immediately to my complete ignorance of neuroimmunology. So I'm going to, this is going to be a rather naive conversation on, on my part. Well, probably mine also. <laughs> <laughs> Too modest. Um, I did not know that glial cells existed outside the brain. Right, well. As Let's start with that. Yes, they do. I mean, it, it's of course an ancient uh, member of the nervous system and it goes back to almost the beginning of evolution of the, of the system. So. Mm -hmm. The, the nervous system, of course, uh, started uh, not only in, what, in the most primordial brain, but it started in, throughout the whole body, and in, particularly in the intestine, actually, where feeding happens. Uh, and do these glial cells outside the CNS, do they perform the same sorts of functions as glia do within the brain? Well, uh, the, f uh, the functions are relatively poorly understood outside the brain, I think. Uh, there, it's the known that there are several classes of them. Uh, it's known that they are kind of required, but it's not known really what they're doing, what, what su functions like support they're providing. For example, in the brain it's a little easier, right, because the, the nerves in the brain are myelinated, mm -hmm. so they are actually insulated, so they will transmit long distance, so to speak. But uh, in the in gut um, nervous system, the, 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 they are not myelinated, the neurons. So the, uh, the, the, yeah. the glial cells are intimately associated with them. Uh, but, um, and the, and they're, of course, they're talking to each other. And as, uh, as they are, uh, as in my talk, um, that what we f find is that they're talking to the immune cells as well. Right. So that is interesting. But exactly what they're doing is still an open area of research. So glial cells in the periphery are still associated with the nerves running to those peripheral organs. That's right, yes. Oh. And, and within, in the, in the case that we study, we're looking within the organ uh, uh, because th uh, the nerves, the nerves that come in, they connect through ganglia to, to the actual various tissue parts of the, of the organ. The, you know, the gut is a, is is a quite a quite a complex collection of uh, so-called, you know, mucosa, which is the the thing that that interfaces with the the con contents of the intestine working your way in different layers all the way to a muscle layer which is involved in the c contraction of course intestines have to s mm. have to contract to move the contents from from the beginning to the end right and it's, and it's not just gravity that does that. no <laughs> at least in our in our situation yeah that's right Sorry. and so um and actually the areas where the muscles are uh, is, is the where the most uh, nerves are and the most glia Mm. The, and the number of glia, I think, in general, are proportional to the number of neurons. What made you come to study glia outside the CNS, and in particular, uh, gut glia? Sure, yes. Well, um, if you look at the, the way that the field developed, uh, it's been known, of course, for a long time that, that the gut was a, was a special site where there's a lot of nervous uh, n neurons, basically. It's even been given the name the second brain. And of course, in the m more primitive organisms, the more primitive they are, the more, the more relatively numer <laughs> numerically in, uh, uh, dominating they are, you know, because the brain's small in, a, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in worms and stuff like that. But um, th so th there was a lot that has been, and we were, it, very interested in the, what the, is the gut nervous system or the enteric nervous system. And most people have been s studying what the effects are of the, of the, the neurons themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we published a paper uh, back in 2020, I think it was now, that um, showed that the, 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 the enteric neurons, in other words, the nerves in the gut, 
uh, play a really important role in, f in fighting infection, which, which uh, was very interesting. And actually, th they do that through making what we had previously and everyone had previously considered to be an immune molecule, which is a cytokine, mm -hmm. so-called IL-18. It's got a number, right? Um, and uh, so that's what my student found back then. And um, th the neurons were making it. And it was pretty interesting because there are many cells that make that material. The, the lining of the gut, the, it's, which is called the epithelium, it's the, it's the barrier, basically. Mm -hmm. Those cells make lots of it. The immune cells make lots of it. And the neurons make a little bit. But actually, the only thing that mattered uh, to fight the infection was what the neurons made. So that's obviously the right amount, the right material made at the at the right place, made for the right place. It's mm -hmm. a kind of a delivery problem. Right. And uh, so that was the, what led up to the interest. But, but, and of course, we all realized uh, that, that, the nervous, the, that the nervous system is intimately comprised of the neurons and, and the glial cells. So the, the immediate question is, well, what's the role of the two components? And the glial cells are pretty much a mystery in the gut so that's that's why we that's why it was the clear next question and the impetus as usual is a curious young person and the curious young person was kevin lao who came from hong kong mm -hmm. he had trained in um, neuroscience in, in the central nervous system working on neurodegeneration mm -hmm. in a very good lab in in hong kong and then so he wanted to learn immunology and, and what more natural would be to look at the interaction of the nervous system and the gut and the uh, immune system in the gut which is so that and what that's what it, in a nutshell he showed he showed that the these cells in these cells interact the nervous the glial cells and the immune cells uh, what was your experimental approach for doing this do you have a, a model a mouse model or that you can use or yes that's right there are two things that we, we needed to do one was perturb uh, the glial cells, so in other words, somehow disadvantage them or make them better, either way. Uh, and the second thing is a, a biological system where we can test the effect. Mm -hmm. And so the system uh, we, we used is a very simple thing. You just put, give a, a positively charged, sorry, a negatively charged uh, polymer in the, in, in the drinking water, and that uh, kills a number of the cells which lie in the gut, which and what that then does is to allow the bacteria that are, that are in the intestine in vast numbers to invade the tissue. And that, when the immune cells meet the, uh, the bacteria, they go berserk and make uh, vast amounts of what we call inflammatory mediators. Now, they've got fancy names, but the, and, and that so that triggers a huge amount of inflammation, and that inflammation. Uh, then leads to a very measurable re readout, which is the con you know the consequences of, of the inflammation, and mm -hmm. you could have read out the inflammation itself. Right. So th then, what we simply did is to ask: Well, if we take away uh, the glial cells, what happens? And w when you do that, then the inflammation actually is dampened, oh. uh, surprisingly, because yes. we might have thought that it was the reverse way around. Um, and then we work from there, and so we. So, it's, I mean, biology is extremely simple-minded, right? What do you do? This it's like a child with Lego. You know, if there's something there, well, does it do something? Well, just take it away and then see if it, if what it, what happens then. So once we found that taking it away had the effect, and then we we find ask, well, what is it? What are the molecules, the bits that make it work? And so we went searching for those, and we were able to identify them step by step, the parts that do it. But, but you said this finding was unusual, unexpected, and I would have thought precisely that. I would have thought if the glial cells were there, things would get better. Yeah. So, so what 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 are the glial cells doing to make the inflammation worse? Uh, yes, I think so, so. The first of all, we is we've so far we've used what I'd call very blunt instruments. Mm. Take them all away. Now these these cells are not a monolithic single thing. There's lots of different kinds and the, 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 you know, the various classes have been described. Mm -hmm. So it's quite likely that you have some, some which do uh, task number one, some that do oh, task number oh. two, and so on and so on. Uh, so that's the first point. Um, the second point is that we look 
in our measurements, we look at when things are at their absolute worst. <laughs> in other words, we let the disease develop and then we pick the most severe point and then we measure what happens. So it's quite possible that in this disease, which from which animals do recover, uh, it's quite possible that we're going to see differences in recovery. And, and the third point is that we know that there's a difference between taking them away and just taking away the, the molecule that we, look, that we were looking at the function of, basically. And that, again, supports the first thing I said, which is there's probably some division of labor. Because taking them all away um, gives a, a, a different level of severity, m more severe, actually, than taking away just a component. So I think, I think what it means is that there's a division of labor in, in, in the system, and uh, we look at the, at the sum of parts, basically. Uh, and when, the, when there's an inflammation, sort of a naturally occurring inflammation, uh, do, the, do the glia start replicating? Do they yeah. multiply? Uh, yes, they increase in number, they increase in activity, and, the immune, and, and their activity is, is to bring in immune cells. And so immune cells, um, it is very standard in the immune system. Immune cells will perform useful functions, but there's always a, a, a cost to that benefit. And the cost is immunoinflammation, and that's a lot of what, what goes wrong, right? So, so it, it's, it, all of this biology is cost-benefit. And remember, we're using a very severe model, mm. which is not, not what you normally have in, in, in normal life. Right? In normal life, you have uh, a minor damage to the, to the gut or, or, or an infection, uh, which starts high in the, in, in the mucosa and works its way through. And, and so evolutionarily, this has all been selected to be useful. And the majority of the useful output put of these cells is probably under much, much more uh, mild circumstances. So are, you, are you going to be able to devise an experimental system where you can examine these uh, more moderate? Yeah, yes, uh, there's lots of things you can do. Uh, you, can, you can deliver an infection. And we do that very commonly the, in the very first case I mentioned to you where we talked about uh, the role of the neurons in that, that molecule, IL-18. We were looking at salmonella infection. <laughs> Most people have heard of salmonella, right? Mm. It's a very unpleasant bug. I've had it once, so it was, uh, uh, um, and, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I will not forget it. Uh, but but it's, um, that, that's, that's media, that, that's, uh, pre, you know, el eliminated by a whole series of immune phenomena which happen. That's one way of doing it. There are other less severe ways of of of, uh, of uh, doing things to the intestine and so on. So there's lots of ways you can you can have a st various stages mm. of severity right. and damage. Right. You mentioned salmonella and and as an, as a distressing infection of human beings. Yeah. Uh, so are you? And of course, this I suppose is the question that always comes up when a scientist is working on biomedical problems like this is, of course, applicability to the, to the human being. Yeah. Uh, might, your, might your findings about the glial involvement in inflammation lead? What sort of human disorders might this sort of thing yeah. be causing? There are two major diseases that, that are, well, are uh, very likely to be um, involved in some degree. One is uh, Crohn's disease and the other is ulcerative colitis. Mm -hmm. They are, although they're both called inflammatory bowel diseases, because they're both diseases of the intestine, they're very different in, in nature. Uh, ulcerative colitis is uh, a, a, an inflammation which is, presu pr it is predominantly in the upper Upper meaning closer to the inside of the intestines area. It's it's the upper layers of the gut, mm -hmm. not not deep. And ex but it extends all the way, f uh, starting at the end, working backwards uh, uh, in the intestine. And um, so that's that's one example. Crohn's disease is very different in that it can happen throughout the intestine. But it happens in, in foci. It happens here and there, but not in between. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting phenomenon right there. Uh, uh, why is that happening like that? And, and uh, so 
the, this kind of thing that we're looking at may, could play a role in, in either of these circumstances, depending on the severity. And we've um, we have a pathologist in the lab actually who's, who who looks at who does for his day job. He actually reads slides for all these things, and uh, so we're talking about ways of trying to uh, to address its relevance to those things. And of course, these days, one of the things that one can do is using modern technology, sequencing technologies. It's actually quite straightforward to get a get a hold of uh, specimens from. Uh, the, the people from not people from from uh, archives. You you can mm. actually do do sequencing now on archival material from slides that were made 20 years ago. Uh, so you can take all of these diseases of the intestines. Or, and uh, we had an example, a simple example of that, where we had a project on cancer, uh, which we published a few years ago. And as an example, we were able using simple technology to show that the mechanism we'd worked out in cancer actually was relevant to all these very rare d diseases because we could get slides mm -hmm. from archival slides from those diseases. If you fast forward to now, um, we can get really deep uh, sequencing information from the same kind of material and then so then we can really look and see all the events that we're we're measuring in, in the models to what degree do they occur in Crohn's or UC, UC being ulcerative colitis, mm -hmm. or other more rare situations. And there's, of course, other things like uh, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, mm -hmm. which is a more poorly, more poorly understood situation, but also involving the immune response, also involving cytokines and the nervous system. The whole thing really, uh, what's exciting to us is that the, the, you have the nervous system and the immune system, you know, working together actually and, and the thing we in the what I've talked about today was um, actually ironically talking about the glial cells and the immune cells and how they interact but of course it's like the elephant you know the, the, the under the under the lamp Wait. right next to them all the, all these neurons the nerves and of course I'm very excited to go see what they're doing and because that's a very big part of the puzzle and uh, you know you can't do everything at once and well I think uh, so that can be, I hope, at the next brain f body brain physiology meeting, we will hear details about that. That would be our pleasure. Thank you very much. You're very, Thank very you. welcome. My pleasure.